get into the Word of God. I, I, I want to tell you something just before we get into the Word of God. I really want to encourage us around a couple of things. I want to encourage us um, that in our journey with the Lord, every single one of us, certainly me, we are called to grow up, not grow old in the Lord. Uh, you, you can do 20 years in the Lord, but it's one year over 20 times. And, and, and the Bible is not much for that. The Bible is about growing the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ from glory to glory, from faith to faith. There is no point where we level out. Uh, I really want to encourage us around never becoming a people of learnt behaviour. Yeah. 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 Come on now. Come on. This is not the time for learnt behaviour. Yeah. This is not the time we will learn to do churchianity. This is the time to get revelation, to get my own conviction, my own passion in the Lord, and my own walk with the Lord. Amen. 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 It is really, really important that we learn the ways of God and not just the acts of God. It's really important. Psalm 103 and verse 7 said that Moses knew the ways of the Lord, but Israel knew only his acts. They knew what God did, but they did not understand the patterns of behavior, the ways of God. It's really important that if we're going to grow in the Lord and press into the things of God according to the fullness that God intends, that we learn the ways of the Lord. And I actually want to speak into one of those things today, one of the critical ways of the Lord, that we, when we look at the biblical pattern, the way that God does things over and over and over and over, it is unmistakably a pattern that God employs in every age and every generation. So with the people of Israel, the Lord intended to call the people to himself. The Lord intended that the people don't have a small life, that wherever they come from, that he would group them together, but that glory would dwell upon them. He intended for them a land flowing with milk and honey. Come on now, church. We're not talking about a visitation of glory. We're talking about a constant flow of milk and honey. That was God's intention. And in order for the Lord to effectuate that, the Lord, there were two aspects of that. There was the Lord's side and then there was the people of God's side. The Lord's side was raw power. You see things like plagues that are raw power. You see things like the opening up the Red Sea, raw power. You see things like the, the walls of Jericho, raw power. What the Lord did for his people and what the Lord did to their enemies, raw power. But then when it comes to the participation, what, what was required of the people of God so that they could experience the fullness of God, as far as I can see the pattern of behaviour that the Lord required, literally the Lord required three things, only three things. At one point, he required them to apply the blood. Because without the blood, they would never come out of slavery. There had to be an application of blood. And it wasn't universal. It wasn't as a nation. It was personal. If you apply the blood, you can exit. If you don't apply the blood, you are damned. Then... We see Israel go on their journey with God and the next thing that the Lord says to them is follow the cloud. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. My presence will go with you, pillar of fire by night, cloud by day, yeah. but you gotta follow the cloud. Yeah. I think this is exactly where we're at as a people of God. We kind of got in the cloud and we're like, woo, <laughs> what is this? This is so cool. The presence of God. What were we doing before this? And we're, we're, we're like, Lord, the glory of the cloud, this is awesome. And, and we're learning, learning beautifully by, by the leadership of the Holy Spirit how to follow the cloud. Yeah. We're, we're, we're learning the, the, the presence of God and how 
to reverence it and how, how the presence of God is everything, how to be mindful of the presence, how to live in the presence, soak in the presence 24 7. People of presence, 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 right? We're, we're learning. But then the Lord had one more thing that actually became the trouble of Israel for the rest of their existence. The Lord wanted them to do one more thing, just one more thing, and they would become everything that was intended in his heart. The Lord wanted them to remove forbidden idols. Just the one last thing. If you check out the journey of Israel from that point forward, the entire struggle of Israel had to do with removing forbidden idols. And had they stepped into that, everything would have changed. And I want to say to us today, that is a parallel time to Numa Church. The ways of the Lord are very clear. And we're right here at the same conjunction, intersection, to remove forbidden idols. So we're going to go hard after it. Not hard after you, not hard after me, but hard after idols. So that they would bow at the name of Jesus. Would you open up with me to the book of Joshua, chapter 24. Book of Joshua 24, it should come up on the screen. These are the dying words of Joshua. Who knows when a man is dying, he's got something to say. It's not waffle. It's not friendly advice. It is the crux of the matter. So Joshua 24 says this. Joshua saying, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth. Don't play around. Put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river. I need us to note that. I need us to know how many times Joshua's going to refer that there's things on that side of a river that should come, never come with you to this side of the river. They have to be left on that side of the river. They were okay for that side of a river, but they'll never be okay on this side of a river. The river divides what you can take with you and what you have to leave behind. He says, serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So the people answered and said, far be it from us that we should Forsake the Lord and serve other gods. For the Lord, our God, is he who brought us and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who did these great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way. They acknowledge God has done so much. How on earth could you say that for, for us that we're not gonna serve the Lord? And in verse 18, and the Lord drove out from before us all the people, including the Amorites and the Ammonites and all of those who dwell in the land, who also, we also will serve the Lord for he is our God. They're affirming, hey, we're going to serve the Lord. Look what Joshua says. Joshua said to the people, you cannot serve the Lord for he is a holy God, he's a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgression nor your sins if you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods. Then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after what the Lord has done to you. And the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. So Joshua said to the people, you are witnesses against yourselves. You have chosen the Lord for yourselves to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. Now, therefore, he also said, put away the foreign gods which are among you. Incline your heart to the Lord God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, the Lord, our God, we will serve. And his voice, we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day, etc. Amazing. Now, I, I, I just wanna set the record straight here as to what Joshua was saying. Joshua is just making very clear, our God is a jealous God. Yeah. Let, let's not get this wrong. Our God is a jealous God and he demands exclusive loyalty. God demands exclusive worship. God will never have dual allegiance. It's never going to happen in any age. 
whether it be the age of law or the age of grace, God will not have dual allegiance. It's either he is God or he is not God. That's why I can't afford to serve God and serve me. I can't afford it. If I'm going to walk in all the fullness of God, I may be washed by the blood, I may be immersed in the cloud, but I'm gonna have to deal with forbidden gods. I'm gonna have to deal with it. I wanna let us know that on the other side of the river, the side that we're stepping into as a church, there is no true awakening until we deal with forbidden gods. There is no true outpouring. There is no true fullness of the flow of the Holy Spirit until we deal with forbidden gods. Revival is about the reinstatement of the worship of the one true God. And if if the reinstatement of the worship of the one true God must mean the removal of the worship of any other God. And I I, I know round about now, most of us are thinking, what, you've been away from city location for a while and you're all hot up in your head. What are you talking about? Who, Who of us worships Artemis? Who of us worships Diana? Well, no one. Because that's not what a forbidden God is. A forbidden God is something that has laid hold of your heart so that it becomes the center of your life. A forbidden God is anything or anyone who now you desire and seek after with all of your might and has all your attention. A forbidding God is the one who has captured your imagination. You wake up thinking about the forbidden God. You go to sleep thinking about the forbidden God. The forbidding God has become priority. The forbidding God has become a longing. The forbidding God is anyone or anything that has become a source of your safety, of your security, of your meaning, of your fulfillment. A source. Do do, do you know how many Christians live under a cloud, but in reality, and and this is not a word of condemnation because the Lord is, our our Heavenly Father is not bringing this to condemn. Our Heavenly Father is bringing this to upgrade. Because because you deserve better because the blood demands better. So he wants to give you better. Do you know how many Christians live for romantic relationships? Do you know how many Christians have made an idol a family? That's the problem with these forbidden gods. They're not evil. But when when a good thing becomes the ultimate thing, it becomes a bad thing. It becomes a forbidden God. It takes the place of God in your life and my life. And the Lord will not have it in any age. Check out Ephesians 5.5. You'll see the Lord will not have it in any age. New Testament age is co-equivalent. Abraham was a man who loved the Lord. We all know his story. Loved the Lord with all of his heart. But there came a point in Abraham's life where he needed to reorder his love. So the Lord says to him, I need you to sacrifice your son. Now God is not a sadist. God doesn't want child sacrifices. But God is getting the man of God to reorder his love. Because he's what the Lord saw, even in his beloved Abraham. He saw that the center of affection was changing. Instead of Abraham waking up in the morning, we, we don't have that at East, so. <laughs> Instead of Abraham waking up in the morning, going, the longing of his heart, exactly like David articulates in Psalm 63. Yeah. Oh God, you are my God. Yeah. Early will I seek you. My soul longs for you. My heart thirsts for you in a dry and thirsty land. Instead of that, he would wake up in the morning, he'd open up the tent and he'd go, how's the boy doing? And he saw that what was love, paternal love and a beautiful promise that the affection had turned into adoration. 
and, 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 and he was like, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. You bring that because that has become a forbidden God to the altar. Yeah. I am a jealous God and I will not have it. You cannot have the altar of a rival God and the altar of the true God in the same heart. Yeah. That's what Jesus said. He says, no, no one can serve two masters. You'll either love the one and hate the other, be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and riches. And it could be anything. It's not just riches. It's anything, anything that takes the place of God that coexists with, with, with the center of the throne in my heart. Now, it's up to you because you can have Holy Spirit up to your ankle deep. So I'm, I'm not talking to those who are interested in ankle deep. Because you can have the cloud and have those things happening. But if you want full immersion, if you want it to go past your hip and over your head, we're going to have to deal. We're going to have to remove forbidden gods. And I believe there is a divine appointment. Numa Church, there is a divine appointment that as we lay down forbidden gods, the gushing of the Holy Spirit is going to be a whole other level. It's the pattern of God. Open up with me to the book of Mark chapter 10 and verse 21. That's what Jesus demanded. Not Old Testament. Mark 10, 21 and 22. Jesus looking at him. This is the rich young ruler. Jesus looking at him. Loved him. Said to him, one thing you lack. Can, can you see that Jesus didn't condemn him? I just want us to see that. Can, can you see that already? There was no condemnation. There was no reproach. Jesus loved him, but he wanted to upgrade him. Yeah. He said to him, hey, one thing you lack. Sell whatever you have and give to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven. Come take up your cross and follow me. But look at this. This is what happens when you have a forbidden God. See, he, he says, but he was sad at his word and went away sorrowful. Do you know why? Just keep it up there for me for a minute. Do you know why? See, forbidden gods will always get you to sacrifice. Yeah. Yeah. So if my forbidden God is my business, I guarantee you if it comes out of whack and that becomes a God in my life, I guarantee you, you will sacrifice your integrity for the sake of the business. If approval becomes your forbidden God, I guarantee you, you will sacrifice honesty and you'll be a two-faced person in order to get approval. Every idol requires sacrifices. So he's so sad because now he's being asked to get rid of a forbidden God. Jesus didn't want his money. You know Jesus doesn't want your money. He's, he's got all the money that he needs. He's got streets of gold. Don't get up in yourself thinking, oh, you know, church wants my money. We want nothing. We want your discipleship. We want what we want for ourselves to follow Jesus wholeheartedly. And we want exactly like this guy. This guy thought he owned his money, but his money owned him. So instead of being a servant, at his disposal, it was a master. It became a forbidden God. And, 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 and the Lord sometimes, exactly as it was with this guy and exactly as it was with Abraham, sometimes we don't know how idolatrous something has become in our life until we're confronted. It was only, it was only when God confronted Abraham about Isaac that he realised, whoa, I need to reorder my love. It was only when, when Jesus confronted this man that he realized, wow, what, what, I, I don't think I can do that. This thing has totally laid hold of me. I wanna, I wanna, before we get to a very clear and simple resolution, tell you at least very quickly four things that forbidding gods will do in a life. It will put you in opposition with God. That's number one. That's New Testament. 
Book of James chapter four and verse four, James talking to those who believe, says adulterers and adulteresses, he's talking spiritually. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? You know what he was saying? He was saying when you walk under the worship of a forbidden God, you literally put yourself in opposition to God. That's quite sobering. The second thing that it will do, it will eliminate the power of God in your life. It really will. It will sap you. It's like hardening of the arteries. The flow of the Holy Spirit is meant to flow through our vein. Is, is meant to flow in your spirit, my spirit. There's meant to be rivers of living water coming out of our heart. You find that there's a hardening of the arteries. You're not as sensible as you once used to be to the spirit of God. It'll eliminate the power of God in your life. It will undermine the purpose of God. Nobody living with a forbidding God ever fulfills God's call on their life. You always fall short like Israel did. Israel did lots of things, but when they came to forbidding gods because they, they did nothing about it, they were like yo-yos and they never saw the full realisation of God's intention. The last one is a critical one. Forbidding gods always become destructive, not only to the person, but to their family line. You need to hear me real good on this because this is Bible. You know the first 20% of the 10 commandments is God dealing with idols. So the first two commandments of the 10, you shall only one thing, only one thing, you shall serve the Lord your God, Him only. You shall have no carved image, the Lord talks about. See, I, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other God before me, says the first commandment. He's saying, I'm not a top God, I am the only God. But you know, straight after that, straight after, given those first two commandments, he says, I am a jealous God who will visit the inequity of the fathers on their sons to the third and fourth generation. Meaning, what you don't deal with, your children are gonna have to deal with. That's heavy. That's a heavy price to pay. That's a heavy price to pay. That is a heavy price to pay for future generations because we haven't dealt with it. Yeah. What about I deal with it before the Lord? Yeah. What about I get rid of it so that my lineage could be blessed and a blessing? What about that? What about that? What about that? Yeah, that's God's intention. Yeah. Now we come to the point where, where it all needs to come to a head because here's where it needs to come to a head. I don't reckon there's any of us here, I really don't think so, that are for one bit intending to lead a double life. Yeah. Give me a wave if you want a double life. No one, right, good. <laughs> no one wants to lead a double life. Most of us have cycles and those cycles have eventuated in our life not because of wickedness but because of weakness. Yeah. And they've developed into ruts and, and, and now we find ourselves not, not wanting in any shape or form a dual life, but we just don't know how, 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 Lord, can I get rid of this thing? Yeah. Well, I believe that's God's assignment this morning. The Lord has said all of that to say this, to say what we're about to step into. You see, once you and I decide Jesus is worth everything I'm afraid of losing. Yeah. Yeah. And that I will not, I God, 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 I will not have another yeah. on the throne of my life besides you. God, I remove forbidden gods, no matter what it looks like, I need it out of my system so that my system could be filled with the Holy Spirit only, only, yeah. to be holy just as you are holy. Yeah. Here's what the Bible says. I want you to open it up in the book of Acts chapter three. Here's what Peter said, taught. Book of Acts chapter three and verse 19. That's known as repentance, by the way. Christians, can I be really honest with you? Repentance is not an event. Yeah. 
Repentance is a lifestyle. He says, repent therefore and be converted that your sins would be blotted out. That's the first thing. Let's just eat humble pie together this morning. I'm ready for God to forgive my sin. Don't get so holy that you think, you know, John was writing to Christians and he says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Can we get raw? Can we get real? Can we take off the halo for just a minute? I know that there are Christians here that are struggling with porn. You're not wicked. But there's cycles and you keep going at it. I know that there's Christians here that are, that the whole thing with achievement has wrecked you. And it's not because you're a bad person, but it's got a hold, it's got a grip. Uh, can I have Acts 319 back please? I, I, I know that that's the case. And the Lord is never shaming, the Lord is beautiful. The Lord is beautiful. The Lord is a redeemer. The Lord is not here to shame me or shame you. The Lord is here, when, when God talks like that, it's because God wants an upgrade. It's because, it's because He loves you beyond your failure. It's because He loves you and, and He's ready exactly where you are. To, he desires truth in the inward part and in the hidden part, He will make us to know wisdom. He desires sincerity, not perfection. It says, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Listen, listen. And times of refreshing, may come from the presence of the Lord. See, that's why Joshua, I love what Joshua does. Joshua says, hey, okay, since you are so adamant to serve the Lord, if that is your decision, if your decision is not dual life, if your decision is to live on this side of the river, if your decision is that, then let us make a covenant with the Lord. You know, a covenant is two sides. The people of God do exactly that. That's our side of the covenant. Our side of the covenant is, you know what, Holy Spirit, I repent. Yeah. You know, I've, I've been walking in this thing. And again, it's not because I'm wicked, but it's because I'm weak. I don't know, I don't know why this thing kind of like keeps popping up in my life. I don't know what's going on, Holy Spirit. But Holy Spirit, I need you to get rid of it for me. You know, here's a beautiful thing about the New Testament in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I don't, I don't, just, get it, I don't just get forgiveness, I get exactly that. I get cleansing. I get cleansing. When I repent, my side of the covenant is to come back in repentance. His side of the covenant is to pour out His Spirit with power and to destroy every forbidden God. That's his side of the covenant. I can't deal with it, but my God can. Do you know how many people we've seen come to this point and, and long-standing ruts, long-standing mountains, years and years, because they came into that point. The Lord poured out his power and they saw their enemies no more. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask the worship team to come up. I, I just wanna show you one more piece of scripture. That in, in, in preparing, Lord, what, what do you wanna say to us today? If, if there was one thing that the Holy Spirit said so loudly, it's this. Um, I'm gonna take us to the book of Exodus, chapter 12. Book of Exodus, chapter 12 and verse 23. The Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians and when he sees the blood, see the power was in the blood. The power was not in the people of Israel. The power was in the blood. The power was in the covenant of blood. As you know, that is a foreshadow of the Messiah's blood on Calvary. And he says, when the, when the Lord sees the blood on the lintel, on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. 
Here's what I believe the Lord said. That all of Satan's authority will be crushed under the weight of the blood of Jesus. Please hear me again. All of Satan's authority will be crushed under the weight of the blood of Jesus. No matter how long I have had a forbidden God in my life, no matter how deep it has laid hold of my affections and my mind and my ways and my behaviour, no matter what has happened, all of Satan's authority will be crushed under the weight of the blood of Jesus. I'm only called to do one thing. I'm only called to bring every forbidden God. Every forbidden God. I'm only called in a, in a, in a minute, in literally a minute between God and I to exactly do what Joshua asked the people to do. Decide for yourselves this day whom you will serve. To do what Elijah did with the people of God in one day, in one day a national revival, because he said to them, if the Lord is God, follow Him, and Baal, follow Him. Don't falter between the two opinions. Don't let the altar of a rival God and the altar of a true God coexist. But bring it. Jacob, in one day, when the Lord said to him, build me an altar, he said to the, everyone around him, deal away with your foreign gods because he knows that there is no coexistence. And I believe the Lord is bringing up to us this very day, Numa Church. The Lord right now wants every forbidden God removed. You're not going to have to do it. You're just going to have to bring it. You're not going to have to uproot it. You're just going to have to bring it. You're going to have to, exactly what the Bible says, repent and be converted. The times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. The Lord has got so much more. Why stop now? And the Lord wants to do it this morning. Lord's going to do it for every single child that responds. You know what? You may be fearing. You may be fearing, what are people going to think of me? Don't you worry about what anyone thinks. And if anyone thinks anything, I'm telling you, they're playing the hypocrite because we've all got stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Why would you fear hypocrisy? Let's fear God. Yeah. You may be fearing God. What if, what if I lay it down and I fail again? What if? But, but listen, listen, can you take responsibility for your part of the covenant and let God be God? Yeah. 